Out of that first batch of follow-up quests from Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, out of the Dungeons & Dragons Essential Kit, Mountain's Toe Goldmine is the most challenging for the player characters, and I'd argue that it is also the most challenging for the Dungeon Master to run, especially if this is their first experience behind the Dungeon Master screen. So we're going to go over this one carefully so that you feel prepared to guide your table through this one and have options when you sit down with your players. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Verdigree Table. I am Ryan Doyle, and we're in the midst of a DM prep series. If you've been watching Watching through this playlist, you know that in several <laughs> earlier videos, I recommended giving the player characters at least access to magical or silvered weapons in those starter quests and or in Phandalin. And that is because the main antagonist, the threat inside the Mountain's Toe gold mine, is were rats, and they are immune to your standard piercing, slashing, and bludgeoning damage from non-magical or non-silvered weapons. Now, if it feels like your party is unprepared to face them, don't panic. If you followed my advice, then they've had plenty of opportunities, way more than the adventure as written <laughs> provides. So you have been more than fair as a dungeon master and as a game designer. And as a game designer and storyteller, learning from failure can be huge. Another option I've been recommending throughout this whole series is using the Stone Cold Reavers to eliminate some of the quests. These mercenaries are maybe the most developed NPCs in the book, but don't appear until the very end and are underutilized, to put it mildly. So having them come in earlier makes more of an impact on the story, and as a game mechanic, eliminating the jobs the player characters have not selected or the Dungeon Master Rather Not Run could be very useful. Now, to maximize player choice as a default, I'd have the players select the first and probably the second as well, only then having the Reavers take the remainder off the board. But the Dungeon Master is a player too, and the one with the most time invested and the most power to make a decision. So if you decide that one of these quests is not for you, that's all right too. So there's your first option, right? Don't run this one. It introduces a whole new faction with the Were Rats who don't really add much to the already very episodic story here, and it funnels the PCs into a very deadly potential combat, even if they are properly prepared, and it has the biggest map we've seen so far, but it's mostly empty rooms. Plus, it introduces the threat of a player character contracting lycanthropy. So if you want to skip this one, cool. Those magical weapons will still be very useful in the dragon barrel later, but there are reasons to include this, or at the least leave the option open to the players, because Don John Raskin can be fun and a very useful NPC, a new faction that can be negotiated with, offers a lot of potential to clever players, and this quest can actually help strengthen the connection between Cryovane, the orcs, and just the rippling consequences that they're causing in the region. As far as the big empty map goes, one way to address that is to reveal the big empty chunks all at once. We talked about this actually in our Sunless Citadel prep as well, but it's your best option to speed things up and keep players interested sometimes. If we are exploring this place room by room, I might give the players M3 when they walk into M2. I'd combine and, you know, kind of fast forward through M5, 6, and 7. You can always just come out and tell the players, hey, there's nothing of interest here, too, to stop them from wasting their time scouring an empty room for treasure and secrets. That's what I do in M10 and M12. Now, some tables really enjoy this dungeon crawling style where game time is carefully measured in torches, rations and encumbrances tracked, the players carefully make their own map based on the DM's descriptions, and empty rooms are valuable as places to cache supplies or fortify and get arrested. You could explore that method of play and change things up a bit for your table, though I think the upcoming Axe Home quest is a better candidate for that if you're interested. Another option is to edit down this map and make your own smaller one. And I actually went on Reddit and found this beauty, which it turns out 
out, this was actually adapted from a simpler one, which was made by Bob World Builder. I've been trying to include useful links to other channels throughout this series. And please let me know in the comments if that's something you like, by the way. I'm not sure it's good for my metrics, sending my viewers elsewhere, but the goal is to provide as much value as possible to you folks out there taking the time to watch this. So please take a second to drop a comment if you find it helpful. Anyway, the first link I shared was Bob's series on Dragon of Icepire Peak, and I think it's useful, plus he seems like just a really good dude, so I don't mind mentioning it again. Links up top, depending on how you're watching this, and definitely down in the description below. Whatever this place looks like on the inside, Don John Raskin is the guy who's going to take us there. If we don't want to use the job board, having this larger-than-life figure approach the party in the Stone Hill Inn or wherever is an easy answer. He's been a prospector, a fur trader, a whaler, a privateer, which just means a pirate with a license, and is filled with stories that he loves telling. If you need inspiration for his tall tales, even if you're just, you know, summarizing them, think about Davy Crockett and Treasure Island Moby Dick. But this is also an opportunity to drop all sorts of lore. Maybe he knows the story of Fandelver's Pact, and players familiar with the Lost Mines will get a little thrill. Or maybe he's heard the story about the Shrine of Savras, which this quest might actually lead to. Don't underestimate the value of having NPCs asking the player characters questions either. Sure, as written, this guy might be kind of like a blustery blowhard, but what if he's a chance for the players to recount some of their past adventures, right? They could remember the highlights of the campaign so far as well as the facts of the story, maybe even forming some connections in the process. Don John could also add some speculation or relevant insights if appropriate. If they build rapport with him, maybe make this a recurring character. With his diverse resume, I could see him popping up just about anywhere with a new job, potentially to great comedic effect. Maybe he takes up mountain climbing and we meet him on the way up to Ice Spire Hold. Then he starts a fishing charter and we see him in Leilon. Have fun with it and take any chance you can to bring in recurring NPCs, the player might like. It's always a great way to deliver plot hooks and information like what happened to these dead orcs that we stumble upon on the way to this mine. The players will likely figure it out themselves, but it's always nice to have a backup plan. If we don't run this quest, I would lift this moment and drop it in the player's path elsewhere. We want to keep reminding them that the orcs and the dragon are connected, providing a through line for this whole adventure. When we do eventually get to Mountain Toe, things get a little tricky right away. As written, the players arrive at that western entrance. Now, if they want to explore for other ways in, awesome, let them. But there are two were rats standing guard there out in the open in hybrid form, so it's obvious what they are. And Don John is going to urge the characters to, quote, eradicate them varmints, though at the DM's discretion, maybe not at this very moment. The guards will want to escort the players to M4, or they'll likely find the way there themselves after dispatching these two were rats. And if we're not talking, there will be a battle royale where the PCs are outnumbered and maybe in real trouble. This has got total party kill energy, even before we consider that some of our characters might not be able to do damage to most of these enemies at all. So it feels pretty obvious that the book wants there to be a conversation here in this were rat den. But if the players fight and lose, we've still got options. Non-lethal damage knockouts and awakening to find Don John and maybe even some of their gear taken as collateral while the party goes and clears out the Shrine of Savras for them. That's also the ask if we do enter negotiations here. Though as written, the were-rats are lying and just trying to get rid of the players with no plan of actually leaving their new home. Of course, you can change that if it feels right to you. Now, I like the Shrine of Savras, and I think it's maybe the best argument for including this quest, though there's other ways to get there. It's also an opportunity to hand out some silvered weapons if we haven't yet. I mean, how did those orcs chase these were-rats off anyway, right? We'll talk about that one next time. Good thing you've subscribed so you don't miss it. Taking a long, hard look at the Mountain's Toe layout, I think the original designers intended for the PCs to reach M4, 
talk it out, then go back out through the west entrance and head for the shrine, only discovering the rest of this gold mine on the way back. The shrine is to the east, so returning from that direction would have the PCs finding the dwarven graves in M16 and or the surviving dwarf miners in M15. If you want to double down on that, you could have a dwarf attempting to defend the graveyard from the carrion crawler out of M11 as the party approaches. The dwarves set up the were-rats as even more, obviously, the bad guys, and once those rat bastards renege on leaving the mine, it will almost definitely be on. Having the miners maybe take care of the giant rats while each PC takes on a were rat and Zaleen Varnister bounces around and maybe runs away when the tide turns could make for a memorable combat, even with the PCs well aware of the immunities they're facing by now. Okay, so I think that addresses most of the questions with the Mountain Stone Gold Mine, but I believe the biggest concern here is the curse of lycanthropy. If one of these were rats bites a player character and they fail their save, boom, your whole campaign is changed. And that can be scary, especially to a new dungeon master. So option one is no bitey. It's their weakest attack, and they wouldn't necessarily be interested in sharing this curse with their enemies anyway. Now me, I like to live a little more dangerously and have big stakes on the table when I'm running my game, which is why I put were creatures and a hag handing out the curse in my forest encounters. There's a short piece in here describing some ways you can handle a player character becoming a lycanthrope. Having it come on gradually, having a PC gain resistance, not immunity from those most common damage types. Having them make saving throws in high stress moments to maintain control and not transform involuntarily. The whole thing is accessible in the preview on the DMs Guild, check it out. And if you can afford to support my work, that's always deeply appreciated. Now, lycanthropy is a topic deserving of its own video entirely, but in my home game, I had a PC get cursed to be a werewolf by Nona Verde, and as he became more powerful, he also became more evil. And the whole party had to weigh the usefulness of his new powers with the risk of him fully transforming and losing control and becoming a monster under the Dungeon Master's control. Ooh ha ha ha. They ultimately burnt through several diamonds with the Blind Priest and the Hill Encounters, failing to make a good enough roll with greater restoration before the cleric used remove curse and rolled high enough to save the day. In the nick of time, too, the full moon was approaching. It created some very fun and memorable story moments at our table, but keep in mind, something like that takes a lot of trust, and I checked in with that player a lot during those sessions to see what they were comfortable with and what they hoped for with their character. So I think you can see there's a lot of potential, but a lot of risk too, so keep communication open. What you definitely don't want is a PC who is cursed with an ability score increase and full immunity to the most common damage types, outshining everyone else at the table with no real reason to seek a cure. It might take a little more work from the Dungeon Master, but by this stage of the campaign, we've got things handled a bit better, right? So we have the imaginative bandwidth to customize and improve things when we see fit. And that's exactly what we're going to do with the Shrine of Sovereigns next time, which seems like a pretty good place to petition a god to remove a curse, right? I will see you there. Until then, have fun, be kind, and thanks so much for watching.